Are you thinking about buying a 9900K but you want to keep your system really teeny tiny? Is the Strix Z390i enough? I've tested a lot of boards in the past and the, the, the ITX boards can be a bit of a tough cookie to crack when it means feeding a CPU like that so much power. So is the Acer Strix up to it? So before we dive into the uh, board itself, essentially in the box you get some stickers, you get your driver CD, and it is still a CD, you get your manual, you get your um, antenna for the Wi-Fi, you get a uh, four SATA cables, I bing the box out of the shot, and then you also get this little cable here, and this little cable here is for your front panel headers. It's an extension, and I would suggest when you get this, what you do is you tuck it down and around here. You can go over this way if you want, but it makes it a lot more visible. Whereas if you go this way, straight underneath the front of your GPU, it's not gonna make a lot of difference at all. It's just a shame that the cables themselves weren't black, but then it would be an, an absolute nightmare for them to be able to even produce that. While I do have it in my hand though, what? Well, I do have it in my hand, and then he puts it down. Yeah, genius. So this section here, uh, that is where one of the M.2s are, because you have one on the front, and that one's got the heat sink. There's a thermal pad on it. This is actually the uh, chipset heat sink as well, but there is another M.2 round the back. With your ITX case, though, when it's fitted, if you think you might need to get to that M.2, all you need to do, because there's quite a big gap between the screw holes, is you can cut a section out the back of your ITX case if it goes in like a normal case you can get access to the back. If it's that way round and you've got your power supply under it, you're in a little bit more of a, a pickle. So, things about the board. One, two, three, four, SATA, all vertical, but to be honest with you, to get them 90 degrees, it would have been a little bit more difficult because I've had memory issues and stuff like that. Only two slots, that's normal for ITX. Something on this top corner, you can see that we have uh, the two white connectors, they're your RGB connectors. The one on the left is a three pin, that's your addressable. The one on the right is the normal four pin. You've got your eight pin power supply connector at the top there. You also have the only three fan headers on there. They're all four pin PWM, but you've essentially got your um, uh, a chassis fan, a CPU fan, and an AIO pump fan header on there. Round the back, in case you are going to be using this for some type of uh, media center or something like this, you get HDMI and a display port. I would suggest that with the higher end CPUs that these are just for emergency. But then you can see that you've got two USB 2s, two USB 3s. You can go a little bit further down and see you've got USB C there. But one thing that you do need to keep in mind is the USB 3 Gen 2 are these two here, not the type C1 above, which is kind of confusing, but you've got gigabit ethernet, your Wi-Fi outlet ports, and then you can also see your um, digital audio out at the back, which does have some funky little capacitors hiding down here, just out the way. But because you know the, the, the space is limited, you've not got um, uh, many of those capacitors on there. I do think it's a bit of a shame that we didn't get a daughter board that ran underneath like this, like we have done before. Big thing that I would say with this though, like I said in the beginning, is the uh, VRMs. Now you can see that you've got a bank of VRMs over here. Can also see this is an entire metal structure all the way across the top. It's massive. So this whole section here, see it comes up the side, and this whole section here, that's one big aluminum heatsink. It's enormous. Now, the weird thing is, is we've obviously got quite a few phases going on around the outside, but it's an ITX board, so normally you find things are a little bit limited. Um, but they've crammed an awful lot in there. And one of the things I will say is, annoyingly, and despite me asking Asus as well, I specifically said to Asus, what are we doing about VRM temps this time? Because they've been known to block them from things like hardware info. Um, and it normally, when it first happened, it made me think it was very hinky. But the thing is, is they don't get hot. I've literally tried my best to get it to throttle because you can tell quite easily if it's going to throttle because the core speeds start to drop down when it gets warm. This hardly gets warm to the touch. We were putting infrared probes on this heatsink 
and it was coming out around 55 degrees. Now I know the temperature at the bottom is going to be different to the heatsink itself, but it gives you a bit of an indicator. None of this really particularly gets hot, and even with the 9900K at um, 5 gigahertz on all eight cores, we had no throttling issues to the point where we even started running this in a passive environment to see if we could get it to like literally spaz itself out and we couldn't. So I think with this board, with any reasonable airflow case, you're not gonna be getting any issues at all. If you've got a mild kind of like fan at the top, the back, or any kind of like airflow around and in the case, you're gonna be fine. You might wanna kind of uh, have a think about things if you were gonna go with a completely passive water-cooled loop or something like that, but you know, considering that it is such a small board and you would be asking it to do quite a lot, I don't think at five gigahertz that's gonna to be too much to ask for. So you're probably wondering why I've got the board in my hand. Well, we finished testing a while ago while I super duperly adjust the camera. We finished testing a while ago because we've had such a short deadline with these because CPUs come in a little bit later um, and obviously had to get previews and stuff done. So we ended up testing this a few a good few days ago and I'm making the video on catch up, which is why I have it here like this now. It does have some uh, RGBs down the uh, back corner, which you can see in the preview that I've done, but results. Now, when you look at the graph, you can see that you've got the ITX in there and you have the uh, Z370, sorry, Z390 Strix E in there because that's the board that I tested the CPU on. This was the second board that I tested. That's why there's only two boards in the graphs. If you want to see how more and more boards do, the next one's going to be the Maximus Extreme. And then the board after that, I believe I'm going to do the formula. So have a look at the graphs. It actually did really well. It did a little bit too well, but we need to remember that this didn't overheat. And that would be the probably the thing that I would say about this the most. Because the second I saw that massive heat sink, it was going to go one of two ways. It was either going to be the type of thing where it needed that because it was having its bottom handed to it, or that massive heat sink was going to be a saving grace. Now, one thing I would say is uh, compared to the 8700K, the 9900K with an overclock is pulling about the same sort of power. So you could put the 9900K in the older version of this without this massive heatsink and with a bit of airflow, a little bit more airflow than this, it would have been fine. Mixes <coughs> massive heatsink in and it actually makes life so much easier. It's, it's genuinely brilliant and I love this heatsink for that exact reason because it stopped any possible issues uh, and I think this may have something to do with the amount of VRM issues that I might have been bringing up recently. I'm not saying they've made it for me but because there has been a lot more focus on VRM heat sinks and stuff I mean I've tested ITX boards before where um, they've had smaller heat sinks than that on them on the back. I mean look at the size of it. So the long and short of it is because you've had all the graphs popping up at the side that you can go in and have a look at. If you want to know more, you can go to the OC3D website, but this ITX board is a little expensive because it's like 200 pound. So yes, for the, like the real estate of the board that you get, it is quite expensive considering you could spend the same sort of money on a full blown ATX rig. But what it also does is because it's so small, it actually makes their life a lot harder because they have to cram a lot more in and they have to still be able to make, have it so that it performs well, doesn't overheat, and also can still fit into all those tiny compartments and everything. So really the only thing that I would pick about is I would have liked these headers to have been down the outside over here, but I get why they're there. And it would have been nice to have had a daughter board on it so that you had slightly better audio because the audio is good, it's all right, but at the end of the day, the reason why I say it is because you don't really have an option with something like this to, ha to have an add-in card. So if you don't like the audio on the back, think about USB external DACs or something like that. Asus actually do USB sound cards that you can use. The Zonars are still available, USB, or you can get something like the uh, Creative X7 that you can put on your desk. Uh, so you've got lots of options there. I really don't have anything bad to say about it. It overclocked to five gigahertz, it didn't overheat. It scored well in the graphs, although to be honest with you, it's such early days, but the fact that it was doing better than the, uh, the full blown ATX Strix and a lot of the results, I think it's a little bit of a cracker. So I have nothing bad to say about it. And if you want an ITX, it's definitely, sh blah, blah, blah. It, sh sh uh, it definitely should be on your shortlist.